Well, I work with sugar addicts. And um, I usually present myself, uh, I have the illness of addiction, and my outlets are in the order of sugar, nicotine, and alcohol. It's only if I go to 12-step meetings that I would say I'm an alcoholic or I'm a sugar addict. But, you know, in the real world, we don't say I am multiple sclerosis or I am cancer. I have multiple sclerosis and I have cancer. So I think it's very important. This is an illness, so we have to address it correctly. Uh, so that it's time to do that now. And, you know, um, I worked with that for, it's going to be 28 years in October. Uh, so uh, I have a long history of fighting the authorities. Because, of course, they told me so many times, you know, it doesn't exist. Sugar addiction is not real. And uh, I've had people ask me and journalists asking me, how come you're so crazy? Keep working at this when you get so much resistant. You're called a charlatan. Uh, you're called crazy, fanatic, blah, 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 blah. And I said, uh, my only answer is, I know I'm right. Is there any more answers you want? I know I'm right. This is real. This is a killer. And also, a very famous low-carb doctor, I don't mention names, <laughs> said in a newspaper once that, well, if sugar addiction exists, at least it is a milder addiction. And I flew through the ceiling, called him up and said, what are you talking about? A milder addiction. It is the worst addiction. And how come it is the worst addiction? Well, are we talking early exposure or are we talking early exposure? Nobody gives a baby alcohol or cocaine. But you know, sugar, flour, processed food, you give that to babies, small children. And another thing, the reason, you know, Paul is here is because I tracked him down about a year and a half ago because one of his lectures at CCAD Atlanta, we had a conference there every year for many years. I love that conference. That's where I learned most of the things I know about addiction. Because there was a lot of doctors and scientists and all that. And they talked about addiction like it was totally natural. So I used to say to people, when I get to Orlando and I get on the airplane, to go to Atlanta for the conference, my shoulders go down. It's like, oh, God, I'm going to be home with my tribe. I can speak, you know, the right language. I don't have to try to convince, you know, all the backwards, uh, nutty, nutty in Sweden. Uh, so, and anyway, he had a lecture that totally changed my way of creating treatment. He talked about Q-induced craving. Q-induced craving versus stress-induced craving, which I understood perfectly well, but Q-induced, I never really thought about that. Well, I learned in treatment uh, and I learned in my recovery in 12-step programs that, you know, what are you going to do in a bar if you don't drink? Don't hang out there because, you know, it might be a trigger for relapse. So, of course, I didn't do that. And that wasn't a problem. <coughs> But you know, how do you stay away from sugar, flour, processed foods? It's everywhere. So I started to put that together and thinking, you know, it's constant exposure. Right, David? Yeah. Every day, every moment, gas station, grocery store, friend's house, everybody is offering you our drug. And very, very few respect that this is a severe addiction. And when we talk about Q-induced craving, you know, uh, what Paul calls addict brain, I call the red dog. And the red dog is not um, killable, as I say. You can't kill it. It's going to be there forever. So you have to learn how to deal with it. And that's what treatment is all about, you know, adding, growing the blue dog, the healthy factors, but at the same time, getting a handle on the red dog. So it doesn't slip you. I used to watch Cesar Milan, you know, the dog whisperer a lot. And once I wrote him a letter, you know, I use many of your methods on my clients, you know, calm and assertive, and you know, you don't back down. 
So uh, that's <coughs> how I was working with it. And you got to be, in a way, shocked when you look at this picture. This is a new treatment method in Sweden for obesity. You put the plug, a hole in the stomach of the client, you put a peg in there, and then they eat what they want, and they have a little tube that you can have in your pocket, and you get the tube out, and you, know, you go to the bathroom and empty. It's called a spire method. Isn't this absurd? You know, except gastric bypass and pills, but I mean, if that's the only treatment methods we have for a multifactorial brain illness, how sick is that? Okay, so I just wanted to show you that. It's horrible. And I think it was you, Nina, that uh, had a picture with Arna Astrup in one of the studies where they said that they probably had it wrong. You know, 2004, when my first book came out about sugar addiction, he worked for Danisco, the sugar company, the Danish sugar company. He slashed it, totally slashed it like rubbish. I thought it was fun to see his name up there. Now I didn't know that. Say hi if you see him. Uh, so anyway, uh, okay, I also wanted to say, Paul talked about uh, different self-help groups. I think there are, I don't know how many self-help groups there are today based on the same, same principle, but uh, there is a new one I want to add, which is AAA, All Addicts Anonymous. That's the one I would like to have in Sweden. We don't. But you know, it doesn't matter which your outlet is, because addiction is addiction is addiction. So that makes it, you know, we could go to that one and share alcoholics and drug addicts and sugar addicts. And I would really like that because I think it is very dangerous to treat one drug at a time. I think we should learn how to treat the addicted brain, to heal the brain, you know, despite which, addict, which outlet we have. So I want to say that. And also, I want to quote David. Is David in the room? Wolfie? Oh, hi, sweetie. <laughs> My little wolf pup, wingman. He said something about willpower. You mentioned willpower. That's like the white unicorn. I think that's a beautiful expression. I used to call it trying to hold the Pilatus ball, you know how big they are, under the water. Have any one of you pressed, pressed the Pilatus ball under the water? You can't do it, and you can certainly not hold it. That's willpower. So, <clears throat> uh, I'm a nurse since 1973, uh, and you know what? Uh, I thought about all this research. Yesterday I didn't talk a lot about research, because I'm a clinician, 100% a clinician. Uh, I don't know all the research that's done in the world. I know a lot about it, but I certainly know how to treat the client. That's been my work for many, many years. I've treated thousands of sugar addicts. And I have some colleagues with me today, you know, from Sweden, and they certainly know too. They're trained by me, and I'm going to let them have a word in here too. And David is treating, and he has created a beautiful treatment model over in U.S., Sugar X Global. So anyway, uh, I have Sippy from Israel also. So we are a gang today, you know. So if you need help, we are spread all over the world. Uh, my first study with sugar, I read 1975 without knowing it. I was working in the maternity ward. And you know, when the baby is uh, one day or two days, we take a PKU test. Do you know what the painkiller we use is? It's 30% sugar. And I remember reading at that time that the sugar, that sugar solution releases endorphins in the baby's brain. So how anyone could be so stupid after all these years to not acknowledge that sugar would affect the brain, that's you know, beyond my thoughts. Read those uh, two studies. Uh, okay, so, you know, I worked with this for many, many years. Uh, so, uh, and been a member of 
uh, NAATP, NADAC, I'm a support member of ASAM, uh, because, you know, I think it's very important to keep up to date what's going on there. The only thing I can say about these organizations is that I'm a put, uh, still a little bit sad that they don't address sugar addiction. And also, I used to say that uh, I'm a sugar addict. I'm not a food addict. And that's a big distinction for me. I have never, you know, hide, lie, and sneak with butter, seared cod, or cucumbers. <laughs> it certainly is other types of food that I hide, lie, and sneak with. But I'm going to also explain to you why uh, a sugar addict can be a binge eater, volume eater, overeater, restrictor, and all that. So it goes with the territory. <clears throat> I've written five books. Uh, 2012, uh, I about croaked. I had a caseload that was absolutely incredible. I was alone in Sweden working with this. Clients called me day and night and emailed me. And I just felt that I can't, I can't do this anymore. I was empathy tired. Uh, and I thought, oh, I got to start growing roses or keep a dog kennel or whatever. I didn't want to hear one more life story than I would puke. So uh, I realized I had to train colleagues. That's when I started the holistic medicine of addiction training. And in 2013, I developed the diagnostic tool that I work with today, which is called SUGAR. Uh, and I certify and license people in SUGAR. And I'm going to ask uh, Jessica and uh, Jennifer to tell you a little bit about that. Uh, 2004, uh, I realized I had to marry integrative functional medicine and orthomolecular medicine field because they were more aware of how to heal a body and a brain with natural things like food or maybe supplements, but lifestyle medicine. You know, uh, the traditional medicine is more like one ill, one pill. And that wasn't my type of uh, medicine. So that's what I did. And now I see and I've seen for quite some while, and that's why I'm here today, because I think that addiction medicine has to date and marry metabolic health medicine. I think it is extremely important when we work with sugar addicts that we understand insulin resistance and you know everything you talked about and HOMA IR and you know continuous glucose meters and whatever. We need new to tools. Uh, okay, so uh, if you're into studies, here's the book to read in my field. There are 10,000 studies on sugar addiction. 2,000 is in this book. Do you need more? <laughs> it's enough. Buy it. If you don't read it, hit it in somebody's head that don't understand sugar addiction. It's pretty big and heavy. Okay, yeah. And here is ASAM's definition. And when I called Paul again, I thought, this was November 2011. It's a year and a half since I called him. How come you have food on there, but you don't work with sugar food addiction? And he answered me that that's because the opioid crisis came in the way. So we got totally busy with that one. And if you haven't read about that, go out and read about it. It's very interesting. So it's here. So this is November 2011. And 2019, I think it was, Paul, that you added medical. I like that, a medical illness, that's good. Only one concern, it's gonna be, uh, try to be treated with pills? No, no, no. I love sobriety-based treatment. I'm not into pills, uh, prescription pills. But what is the problem in our world, you know? I've talked about this before in uh, certain places, but uh, the problem here is that this is called so many names. That's why it is so confusing. Uh, you know, we talk about anorexia, starving, restriction, bulimia, purging, binge eating, binge eating disorder, binging, eating disorder, eating disorder pathology, binge overeating, boats of overeating, purging, episodes of overeating, food obsession, emotional eating, compulsive eating pattern, overeating, volume eating, grazing, overabundance, greater supersizing, substance and behaviors that offer no sustenance, 
disordered eating, orthorexia, megarexia, obesity, sugar addiction, and food addiction. What in the whole world? If you are a client, you're going to be more than confused in this world. And then, you know, all these different treatment met methods that each one that believe in this method of professional people, they say, my method is right, and so forth. They don't listen to the science, you know. This was the way it was with alcoholism when I started. We had type 1 alcoholism, type 2 alcoholism. We had heavy drinkers. We had binge drinkers, and so on. So, you know, that's not strange, but it's even worse here when it comes to food. So one of the things we have to do is, you know, use one name and define what it means. And of course, in my world, it is sugar addiction because it is sugar carbs that is the psychoactive factor that affects the brain. So that's why I will always call it sugar addiction, and everybody else can do what they want, but that's not my game. <laughs> and also we have to dare diagnose. Without diagnose, our illness is homeless. Where would you put it? Okay. Addiction comes from the Latin's addicere, which means enslaved. And sure, look to the left, very enslaved. That's how it feels to be an addict. You are alone in your head with your red dog. And that's no fun, uh, you know, company. I thought about what um, Paul said, a quote. Uh, I love that one too. And uh, 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 an addict that's alone is in bad company. But correct treatment, addressing, you know, the illness and treat it will definitely help you to break free. That's what he talked about when it comes to recovery, to teach clients how to recover. And you cannot do that by having them read, analyze, and talk. It's not going to work. Neurons that wire together fire together. So the only thing that works is into action. They have to do different. And that's not the easiest thing when they are depleted of energy feel lousy, full of shame, miserable, failures. But that's the only way to help them going is to say, you can do it one day at a time. Can you stay out of sugar, flour, and processed food only for today? They said, sure, I can do one day. You know. And then you said, okay, when they handle that, you say, could you do another day? Could you do another day? You know, until they start feeling better. Then they realize what the drug foods is doing to them, depleting them of energy. So when the energy rises, they want to learn more. They want to start doing things. So my advice is, if you're going to work with these people, the only thing you do in the beginning is change fuel mix. Change fuel mix in them to restore mitochondria, insulin levels, neurotransmitters, and I think Asim left the building. <laughs> President Obama left the building, as they say in the US. Uh, but uh, he asked about serotonin and Lustig's notion that could fructose create depression? And I said, yes, but I think it is the mechanism through the intestine, because serotonin is made in your intestine. So if you eat junk food, it's going to ruin your microbiome. And this is very interesting. And I don't have time to go into that now, but I promise you, that is one of the factors that really makes a sugar addict feel miserable, depressed, panic anxiety. Not to talk about volatile blood sugar. If you combine those two, you feel really lousy. Uh, but so the brain and the stomach, you know, and they talk to each other all the time. So you have to repair the microbiome in order for the body to start creating neurotransmitters. I think that's the mechanism behind it. So there are many interesting things to learn about that. And remember, gluten, we have much more gluten in everything today. So gluten is an abrasive. It ruins your villi in your intestines. And when, you, when your villi is gone, you don't take up nutrients. It's like, you know, a slippery slope. 
All the nutrients go zoop, through your intestine. No nutrients up to the body and the brain. We want this person, you know, free, connected, happy, joyous, and free. This is a picture we have of a sugar addict. That's not true anymore. It takes many shapes, many shapes. You cannot see a client and think that you understand what's going on. <clears throat> so it has to be more to it. And also, all those behaviors that people think are diagnosis. I have had clients with, you know, uh, restriction, purging, bulimia, you know, all kinds of symptoms. But I never um, saw it as separate diagnosis. And I will tell you, I would never in a million years work with an eating disorder client. I only work with addicts. But, you know, most eating disorder clients are addicts underlying it all. If you know the right questions to ask, you're going to see that addiction causes what I call process addiction, like restriction, binging, purging, volume eating. So that is the client's way to trying to cope with the horrible, horrible craving that's in their brain from what sugar, flour, and processed food is doing to them. I'm not going to say all those words anymore. I just say sugar, but I mean all of those. So this is the progress. This is, if I, when I ask clients, you know, about their history and I do an assessment on them, this is what I see. Uh, when I ask them, you know, what did you like to eat when you were a kid? Well, I was a sugar rat, a cookie monster. That's what they say. Oh, yeah. Okay. I understand. So what about your teenage years? Oh, God, that's when I started dieting and I dieted and I dieted, you know. And uh, so I was starving myself and I was, you know, restricting and starving myself. Why did you do that? Because of my incredible appetite. Because I had cravings like you wouldn't believe it. When I was in nursing school, I got taught that if you start smoking, then you curb your appetite. That's why I started smoking. Not because it was, you know, exciting or in or anything in that way. Just because, you know, to lose uh, some kilos. That's why I did it. Some get, you know, such a hit in their reward center that they turn into restrictors, or as some would call it, anorexia. Uh, I like to point out that the difference between eating disorder and sugar addiction in my world is that sugar addiction, any addiction, is a primary acquired illness. It doesn't have a cause. Eating disorder is psychological. It's due to some kind of trauma or something that happened. Those two distinguish uh, in, uh, is what I do. And I don't work with eating disorder. I only work with addicts. Okay. This is Nicholas, my last client, 2019, 183 kilo. Many visits to the doctor's office, got many, many different diagnoses. And he was also, you know, uh, checked out by the social uh, office uh, in his hometown. Uh, many diagnoses. Nobody said addiction. When I met him, he was 27 and he was unemployed, lived with his father, ate, slept, and gaming all night long. No social life, totally isolated. So I started, you know, to look at his background. And this is what I found out. I'm not saying that all these diagnoses in the blue are caused by addiction, but many, many times it is, if you ask the right questions. This is what healthcare professionals or people trained in different clinics see. They see obesity, borderline, underweight, social phobia, high blood pressure, depression, diabetes, bipolar, ADHD, chronic inflammation, you know, medical assisted treatment for heroin or uh, GAD, anxiety, PTSD, intimate disorder, childhood trauma, uh, and many, many more. So when we do the assessment and the diagnostic and we find sugar addiction and we treat it correctly, you, wouldn't, you would be shocked how many of these clients that lose their diagnosis. 
So I would say that addiction hides in plain, plain sight. It's a very sneaky illness. And people are afraid of it. People see that somebody behaves strange in that way with alcohol or food, but nobody wants to talk to that person. Nobody likes to go to somebody and say, hey, I think your eating is sick. You know, I think you need help. Who is doing that? Or uh, you should have an assessment of your drinking. You know, we don't do that. We think that it is that person's problem. They should be able to take care of it, but they have lost control. They are like missiles locked on target on the drug. They can't do it. <clears throat> we don't see the forest because of all the trees, is what I say. I think, you know, I don't know about here, but in Sweden we say that probably 12 to 15 percent are alcoholics. I would say if you compare to sugar addicts, I would say that we have 60 to 70 percent sugar addicts. So you can see what a huge problem we have to work with. And also, is Steve Bennett here? Oh, well, there you are. Thank you. Jen asked you, right? No, but I don't need to speak later. That's fine. <laughs> no. I emailed Jen, asked him if I could do this, because I thought you missed this. No you missed the diction there, <laughs> because it starts very, very early. It's a beautiful picture, and when I show it, people love it. So, you know, just adding addiction, I think, you know, we're on the right track here since addiction develops very, very early, around four to five years of age, except in one country. This is amazing. When we do the sugar assessment, we can see which, uh, the first symptom at which age. So in Europe, we have ladies, four to five years of age, right? And we do a lot. They do most sugar in the whole world in their clinic. So, which country do you have much later? You're not going to believe this. U.S. 12, 15. Why is that? When I look at the curve of the sugars down on people in U.S., I can immediately see that the client has symptoms much, much earlier, but they're not aware of it. Why is that? Because they are immersed in the drug from very early age. So it's not until they come up in the teenage year, they start dieting. Whereas, you know, in Sweden, where we don't eat so much junk food yet, kids notice that they start stealing, hiding, lying. They don't have to do that in the US. I'm pretty sure that is the answer. That's my theory anyway. Let's see if I'm proven wrong. Okay, so how much more research do we need to do that sleep is good, physical activity is good, eating healthy is good, you know, anything more? <laughs> um, of course, we're not going to stop doing research, but my friends, we do know a lot, but how come we don't do what we know? David, what's the problem? Why don't your client do what you tell them? <laughs> and all you others, why? What's wrong? Well, because they're addicted. We need action and courage. We need to really, really dare tell our clients, you have a severe problem. And by doing sugar assessment, I'm going to show you, that's the way to do it. Uh, I need to jump. You know, I always love to talk too much. Uh, okay, addiction interaction disorder. Uh, in the screening instrument that I've developed after another screening, well, not screening, uh, sorry, diagnostic instrument, uh, uh, based on uh, one for alcohol, pills, and drugs. And the one uh, here is called sugar, of course. That's smart. Uh, you know, we screen for many other outlets, which I think is very, very important. Uh, so in the US, addiction is called the big imitator.
because, you know, it comes to every clinic in the hospital, every psychiatric unit, and they don't say, hey, doc, I'm an addict, could you help me? <laughs> they come and, you know, talk about other problems. So every medical person, everyone working in the health field should know the hidden signs of addiction because it's really hiding. And, you know, <clears throat> We know that sugar is the first one. That's a gateway drug. And now we have screens. And there is new research that screens on young children change their brain, you know, in a way that's not good. We have subscription pills, opioids, amphetamine, heroin, cocaine, nicotine, work, exercise, sex, love, alcohol, money, synthetic drugs. And as Abby said, you know, she tried everything. And that's what most addicts do. And it's more like lucky if you are in an environment that where you don't get to use all the drugs. But this is the addicted brain. So we have to work with healing the brain and not the drug. Uh, only 5 to 17% uh, of clients we see today have only one outlet. And we think that 80% of relapses the first two years is due to an unknown outlet that we haven't found out about. Right? Ladies, they nod. They don't dare do anything else when I talk. <laughs> so we can't guess. We don't treat guessing. None of us do. We want to know what is the problem. What shall I do about it? And also I love what uh, I said about David, that he is harmful use. You know, harmful, there are actually three types. There's social users. You know, there are people that can have a small piece of chocolate, and then they said, oh, that was so rich. I'm satisfied. You know, I think, is it a hole in your head? <laughs> Why not do research on you and see what's going on there? I would never do that. It's no stop button when it comes to chocolate in my world. But, you know, Carlton Erickson, professor at Texas University, he's taught me that that with harmful use, which is the second group, you know, we should ask why. Why do you eat when you're stressed? Why do you eat when you're sad? Why do you eat uh, to celebrate when you're happy? You know, why, why, why? Party, culture, feeling, stress, etc. It's very important to see if you have a harmful user in front of you, you use moderation therapy. You teach them to improve their eating but they don't have to take away like the biscuits. Or, or have you taken them all away, David? Yes. Oh, good. For nine years. <laughs> <laughs> Woo okay, but you see what I mean. They can have things in moderation without being unhealthy from it. Addiction, uh-uh. 100% abstinence. That's what Paul talked about. The drug has to go first. There is absolutely no meaning doing anything constructive work with an addict if the drug doesn't go. And I totally believe in cold turkey because it's very painful for an addict to cut down on sugar. That would be like saying to a heroinist, you know, why don't you take a little bit of heroin on Saturday? It's not going to work. So, total. Uh, the way I work with them is that I do UNCOPE, which is a screening instrument based on DSM-5 criteria made by Norm Hoffman in US, you know. Uh, six simple questions that they answer first, and then from there we go. And then we do an assessment called pre-assessment evaluation, which is 13 pages, which the client fills in all by themselves. We can do blood work, metabolic dysfunction, liver test, on and on. That's assessment part, and then we do the diagnostic tool. So the background of that is that it was developed 1980 by Norm Hoffman, and you can watch his website. Uh, and today that's called SADS-5, uh, and it was made in Sweden, uh, translated and made in Sweden in 1989, called ADIS, Alcohol and Drug Diagnostic Instrument, uh, and it's based on ICD-10, and DSM-5. And they also won for uh, teenagers, you know, 13 to 19 years of age, called Addis Adolescent. And then there is one screening, a diagnostic instrument for games. <clears throat> you 
you can read about these and the validation they have done on them. And Addis is recommended by the National Board of Health in Sweden for alcohol and drug addiction treatment. <clears throat> I did sugar in 2000, but I used Addis and I switched the word alcohol to sugar. So in 2013, I did the first prototype in paper. And 2019, we could do it as a net version. And we are planning to do a sugar adolescent, 12 to 19 years of age. Why is screening diagnosed so important? Well, it's unethical to treat someone without knowing what's going on. Risk for incorrect treatment in regards to abuse, harmful use, and dependency. Essential for an individual's understanding of his, her condition, motivation, and formulation of goals. Uh, I mean, I could probably talk to a sugar addict since I've listened to thousands. And, and in 20 minutes, I could probably hear if this is an addiction or not. But, you know, that doesn't help. The client has to understand that they have an addiction. They have to embrace it, to own it. That's when recovery can take place. So that's what it's for. And also important when you do research. And also, of course, you know, what kind of treatment, the severity, and the ingredients in treatment. So sugar is a therapeutic interview, but not therapy. Objective, not dependent on who does the assessment as long as you're certified and licensed. By me, I'm the only one allowed to do it. Oh, -ho. <laughs> provides quality insurance for both you and your client, aids clients in gaining insight, which in return affects acceptance, motivation, and compliance. And I'm going to interview these two ladies in a minute. Provides information essential for pre precise treatment, screening for other outlets, but basically takes away stigma. It's a disease. That's what's so important. Okay, I thought I'd ask Jennifer first. Uh, in a few words, what, um, what does it give clients? Okay, so my name is Jennifer and I am working as a sugar addiction therapist today in Stockholm, Sweden. And uh, I used to work with addiction before. And, uh, it, I, I find that it's really similar, um, the addiction of alcoholism and the addiction of uh, sugar addiction. And when I started working with sugar addiction, I didn't have this tool. But uh, after a year, I got it from Britain. I certified and we started using it. And it's such a, good, it's such a different in treating the clients. It's so much shame with this disease and many people have felt that there's something wrong with them all their lives and coming, talking to someone and seeing things in front of you with documents, you get a graph, you can follow, you can see your life, you can see depression, you can see like if you had other outlets that like alcohol, if it switched. So, uh, many times they are just saying like, wow, you're taking me serious. This is really a disease and I didn't know that and I thought something was wrong with me. So it's, it's, it's really helpful also to get a safe environment before the treatment. Okay. So Jessica, you said something interesting to me a few weeks ago when I asked your take on this. And so what is it for the staff? My uh, experience from the staff is that we uh, feel less, um, less stress. The environment uh, for the treatment is better for us because we know, we know that there is addiction behind. So we can also uh, um, address the gap, uh, anxiety, we can address other things as well because we know that there are some uh, similar coping strategies, but we know behind all this there is an addiction. And that fits me more safe than all my consultants as well. And you said to me, you know, it prevents burnout among the staff because I don't have to argue with the clients if they are addicted or not. Because, you know, a lot of clients will say, yeah, I'm a little bit addicted. I'm a little bit pregnant, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and 
today I'm pregnant, today I'm not, tomorrow I'm not, you know, I can eat what I want tomorrow, but today I can't, blah, 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 blah. And that's what addicts do. Addicts want us to remove their consequences of the illness, but by God, don't take away the drug for, from me. That's basically what they want. So this is, when you've done the 67 questions in sugar, this is the way it looks on your computer. So you see, you have the checklist. Uh, you have ICD-10 uh, addiction. You have ICD-10 harmful use. Uh, you have DSM-5 addiction. You get a weight history. You have a substance list with all the psychoactive pills, street drugs, and so forth. You have a timeline that shows you know the symptoms in, in time order. You have a symptom curve, and you write a background assessment and recommendation for treatment. I'm not going to go in through all of these, but this is, for instance, the ICD-10 checklist. And this particular client has 19 actual symptoms spread in all six criteria. All you need is three symptoms in three criteria. So this is truly an addiction, right? Uh, DSM-5, the same, you know, you have 20, 22 symptoms in 10 criteria. And this is the paper that clients get. They get their own checklist. So they get to look at this. These are my symptoms. They take this home and read it. And we go through it in the follow-up, of course. Then you have a timeline uh, which put the same symptoms but in age order. So here you can actually see, you know, at what point in their life had they already developed addiction, i.e. three symptoms in three criteria. And for this particular client, it was at the age of six already. Then you have to remember that most, the age the clients come to us are 45, 40, 45 somewhere. Can you imagine the battle it is with this illness for all those years? Starting with Weight Watchers and, you know, all the things they have done to try to control this illness, which can't be controlled. Uh, so if you want to talk to these ladies, they are uh, starting... Uh, Treatment in English coming fall. This is the curve on my first client, my last client, Niklas. The black dots are his symptoms of sugar addiction, and the blue curve is his weight, trying to you know, uh, diet and all that. And the red is alcohol, uh, the purple is cannabis, amphetamine, opioids, sedatives, steroids, going to the gym, gaming, nicotine. Uh, I asked him, how come you started with all that? I was trying to curb my appetite so I could lose weight. That was his comment. Uh, <clears throat> that was his Addis curve. You can see his rapid progression. Each little dot is a rapid progression of addiction for all those drugs that I mentioned. Uh, we can jump that one. This is Nicholas today, or this is a year ago. 27, you know, he still have a lot of problems. He's been in relapse, but he's now working with David at Sugar X Global, which I forced him to do because he was so filled of anger and shame that he relapsed because he was doing really well before he went into his relapse. At that time, so I haven't done a new one of those, but his blood glucose was normal, normal. Uh, we took away two of his blood pressure meds, you know, C-peptide was normal here about a year ago. He still had some lingering health problems at that time. He had a dentist, superativa, and constipation, but they are better now. He studied and was working as a alcohol and drug counselor and worked full time, had his own apartment, not living with dad anymore. He was learning to cook. He lost 83 kilo and he had an active social life and went to meetings. So one year later, he's in relapse. He hasn't gained everything back, but he was in bad shape. So I'm very happy David is taking care of him. This is another curve. This is the one from the sugar instrument that the clients get. And here you have an onset uh, of uh, six years, I think it is. No, eight, maybe. It's hard to see on that. Eight. 
And then you see the each, each dot is one symptom down. It's a progressive illness, you know. And then you have here some interesting flat lines when nothing happens. What do you think happens there? Anyone want to guess? Huh? You didn't turn up, so you didn't have a record. No, 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 no. This is done in one sitting. This whole interview is always done in one sitting. The flat lines, when we go into that, is falling in love, being pregnant, um, weight watchers and dieting like crazy, going to the gym, uh, drinking alcohol. I mean, they have another outlet. So then they don't have the energy to do that, and then they get sicker again. So that's usually what we see. Because if you look at the weight curve, which is the gray, you see it doesn't look very healthy, right? So something is going on. OK. Sugar is, uh, you know, currently in English, Swedish, Danish, and Spanish. And soon we will have it in Finnish, Hungarian, and Polish. And if you're interested in getting a demo of how the sugar diagnostic tool works, please let me know. And I'm happy to do that on Zoom with you. So I'm going to end my talk. And uh, hoping you would join us to be a proud starfish thrower. If you don't know the poem, you know, it is the mom and her daughter walking on the beach and thousands of starfish have blown up on the sand, and they're going to die if they don't come back in the water, right? <clears throat> so the daughter is picking one starfish at a time up, throwing it back in the water, and the mom said, but wait a minute, you can't save all these, so it's not going to make a difference. And the daughter said, well, mom, it's going to make a difference for this one. She picks up one more and throw it in. So each one of us can throw in a starfish. And we have these mugs and t-shirt. If you want to uh, pre-order them, we can send them over. So money here is going to education about sugar addiction. Oh, -ho. because that's what it starts with. OK, uh, am I done? Oh, you're keeping track of the time. I'm, I'm sure I, I could talk for many more hours, but I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I think we give a round of applause. I think you.